Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Uh, welcome to edition 62 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, oh, by the way, and welcome to summer. Happy summer to you as well. Uh, I'm your host here. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next yeah, push in half an hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me. I think that deserve your attention deserve you to, uh, to be aware of them. Um, as always, as I say every week, every comment, question, reaction, whatever to the show, not only can be, it should be directed to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And again, as always, I figure you didn't catch that. So uh, you can go to my website, which is uh, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and that'll be displayed around here somewhere a couple of times during the show. And you can go there and get the email address directly from there. Now, I do answer my email, sometimes a little slow about it, uh, but I do answer it. Uh, and uh, um, the only thing I ask is that uh, when you send me email, um, be sure to include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam, okay? so. With that, onward. Uh, I'm going to start, as I always like to when I can, with a couple of bits of good news. Um, one thing is that I've been talking, I've been talking recently about, um, well, I don't want to call it a continuing stream, but at least a continuing trickle of good news on the topic of uh, same-sex marriage. One part of that is that the state of Washington, uh, the legislature passed a bill allowing for same-sex marriage. However, uh, that, that law has been delayed in its implementation uh, because opponents of this got enough signatures to have it put on the ballot as a referendum question come November. Now, the record for these referendum questions on the topic is not good. Uh, in most cases, a combination of uh, bigotry, fear-mongering, and outright li lies about the effects of these laws undertaken by the opponents of them um, generally carry the day for the, for the reactionaries. So the bit of good news here in this is that according to the latest polls by public opinion polling, public policy polling, excuse me, 51% um, of Washington voters say same-sex marriage should be legal and only 42% said it shouldn't be. Uh, now that's not an overwhelming lead on the ballot question. It, it is a hopeful one. Uh, more hopeful, in fact, for the longer term of public policy polling dug a little deeper here and they discovered that 77%, the same poll, discovered that 77% of Washington voters would approve of some form of legal recognition of same-sex marriage. 47% said you should be able to get married. An additional 30% said you should be able to have civil unions. Only 21% said there should be no legal recognition at all. So the overwhelming opinion in uh, Washington is that, yes, you should have legal recognition of same -se for same-sex couples. And the thing is about this referendum, another thing about it, a few years ago, the, the bigots were sneering that, you know, only unelected judges imposed same-sex marriage, and that was never done by any actual elected body. Well, now several state legislatures have passed laws allowing for same-sex marriage. So the bigots have their fallback position, which is that, well, it's never been done by referendum. This year, Maine, Maryland, Minnesota, and of course Washington are actually poised to do precisely that. All four of those states have referendums about same-sex marriage, and the pro-marriage forces are in the lead in all four states, in some cases by a healthy margin. So if all these four states then pass these pro-same-sex marriage referenda, I wonder what the fallback position of the bigots is going to be then. All right, the other bit of good news. The other bit of good news. Last week, Rhode Island became the first state in the nation to pass a homeless bill of rights. And they did so without significant opposition. Now, this measure bans discrimination against homeless people. Uh, it affirms their equal right to, to jobs, to housing, to public services, and so on. Guarantees homeless people the right to use public sidewalks, parks, transportation, and public buildings, quoting, without discrimination on the basis of his or her housing status. In other words, they could use them the same as everybody else could. 
It also guarantees a reasonable expectation of privacy in your personal possessions of the same sort of that somebody who has a home could expect. Now, this simple, straightforward, and very humane legislation actually flies in the face of a trend in U.S. cities to criminalize homelessness and anything to do with homelessness. Now, not that long ago, the homeless were a source of concern. They are a focus of concern in our public discussions. Um, and with an estimated 643,000 people homeless on any given night in the United States today, you'd think they still would be. But instead of dealing with homelessness, uh, cities have, increasing, have increasingly been focusing on hiding homelessness. It's been a case of out of sight, out of mind, and we're going to make damn sure you're out of our sight. A report in April from the White House's Interagency Council on Homelessness noted a proliferation of local measures to criminalize acts of living, such as sitting, standing, asking for money in public places. In St. Louis, police there cleared out three homeless encampments that had been set up along the Mississippi River, in response to which a local minister leased a piece of ground for the purpose of the homeless being able to stay there and the cops threw them out of there as well. San Francisco has a ban on sitting on the sidewalk between, 11 and, uh, between 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. Sit on the sidewalk in San Francisco and you can be fined $500. In San Jose, California, until recently, you know, police would sweep through homeless encampments, kick everybody out, take up all their personal possessions, and throw them away. In Philadelphia, an ordinance took effect just on June 1st, just a couple of weeks ago, under which charities, publicly, public charities, recognized charities, cannot even feed homeless people in places like public parks. They can't even set up like a food table to give out food. The fact is, if you're homeless, uh, you're regarded as a blight, you're looked down on, sneered at, you're dismissed, you're treated almost like a carrier of some disease that needs to be quarantined. But now, happily, not in Rhode Island. Not anymore. So congratulations, Rhode Island. Roger Williams would be proud of you. Okay, from there, we're going to, well, it's becoming a regular feature. I didn't intend it to be originally when I first introduced it, which is the Clown Award, I called it. It has now formerly been dubbed the Clarabelle Award. Uh, and the... Um, I mean, originally, it was, it was just the idea that occasionally something would just strike me as just so stupid that it deserved note. Um, and again, I thought it was going to be an occasional feature, but I keep finding reasons for it. So, uh, here is our current edition of the Clarabelle Award. And this time, the honored recipient of the Clarabelle Award, the, uh, the, the award is being given to, uh, his name is Eric Hovde. He's a candidate for the Gopper nomination for U.S. Senate in Wisconsin. During a presentation to a local chamber of commerce, uh, he ran through the usual corporate bromides about cutting corporate taxes, slashing programs, lowering the deficit. He then went on to say that he prayed, and yes, he used the word pray, that the media will write about the deficit and stop writing sob stories, and yes, he did say sob stories, about people struggling in the recession. Quoting him now, he said, Stop always writing about, oh, the person couldn't get, you know, their food stamps or this or that. Now, leaving aside, leave aside the fact that the National Journal did a study of the five largest circulation newspapers in the United States and discovered that the media is already giving at least as much attention to the deficit as to unemployment and, in fact, generally far more. Leave that aside. And actually, you can see Hovda's point, because the last thing any right-winger wants is for you to hear about the effects on actual people of the things that they propose. Sean Lansing, spokesman for the campaign, said Hovda was saying, quoting Lansing, that issues like waste, fraud, abuse, and out-of-control government spending are what's really hurting the poor. Well, frankly, barf. I remember years back hearing some lame-o gopper candidate for Congress who claimed that, and this is quoting, the cruelest tax on the poor is inflation. Yeah, inflation. Not hunger, 
not unemployment, not inadequate housing, not inadequate schooling, not lack of public services, not lack of health care, not lack of opportunity, not lack of the future or a hope for when. No, none of that is the cruelest tax on the poor. No, it's inflation. Then, as now, the goppers will tell you that the real tax on the poor, anytime they could be deigned to mention it, is whatever the goppers are worried about at the moment, whatever affects them at the moment. Well, frankly, that guy back then was a clown. And Eric Hovda and Sean Lansing, you are clowns. Okay, moving on. I have just a quick comment here I'm going to make. Uh, just, just a quick comment, almost in passing. Now, you know, or at least you should be able to tell, that I spent very little time on the, the horse race aspects of politics, of to particular campaigns, who's up, who's down, who said what about who. Uh, but this case is something that struck me as so boorish, I thought it deserved notice. Vicki Kennedy, she's Ted Kennedy's widow, she'd invited Scott Brown and Elizabeth Warren for a campaign debate to take place in late September. It would be co-sponsored by the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, which she is taking the lead in organizing, and UMass Boston. Well, Scott Pretty Boy Brown refused to take part unless Vicki Kennedy stayed entirely neutral in the race and wouldn't endorse anybody. Now, the Kennedy Institute and UMass Boston, to their credit, both refused to buckle to this idiocy, calling it unprecedented and noting it was not being required of any other person or entity. Well, in that case, forget the whole thing, goes the Brown campaign. Revealingly, uh, the campaign manager, a guy named Jim Barnett, said, quoting him, we cannot accept a debate invitation from someone who plans to endorse Scott Brown's opponent. In other words, it wasn't the issue of an endorsement that was a problem for them. It was who she would endorse, and it wasn't Scott Brown. And like a typical gopper, when he couldn't manipulate things to his own advantage, he ran away. Pretty Boy Brown is a coward. All right, moving on to um, our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Um, early in June, the New York Times proved that the much maligned mainstream media actually can be of considerable value uh, when it actually does its job. It published a couple of pieces on the Obama crowd's supposed national security initiatives. One was about the use of drones as, as tools of assassination and the kill list drawn up so Obama could decide who we're going to kill today. The other was about cyber warfare directed against Iran. Both of these are based on classified information. And I'll note, I have talked about both of these articles in previous editions of Left Side of the Aisle. Well, now there's this big brouhaha about the fact that the paper published the information. Both Democrats and Republicans, or Demopublicans as they should be called, these Demopublicans condemned the leaks and the anonymous sources who did the leaking. There were charges of having endangered national security. Senior members of the Intelligence Committee of both houses vowed to crack down even further on whistleblowers and leakers than the White House already has. And remember, President Hopi Changey here already has charged more whistleblowers under the Espionage Act than all previous presidents combined, and the act is 95 years old. To its credit, the Times is standing by its decision to publish these pieces. But here's the point. This is classic misdirection. This is classic mis misdirection. It's a classic case of trying to change the subject to the accuser to the point where you no longer pay any attention to the accusation. The White House has a program of assassination where a group of them, including the great Mr. O himself, sit down and go through a kill list of potential dead people to decide who we're going to drop a bomb on. As part of this program, they lie about civilian casualties by defining every male of, of military age in the vicinity as a combatant, even though they don't know the first damn thing about those people. At the same time as this is going on, the O-Gang also is committing acts of war against Iran, actively trying to disrupt and cripple its industrial infrastructure without even a justifiable claim of self-defense because the administration's own intelligence agencies are telling it Iran has no nuclear weapons program. Assassination, lies, unprovoked attacks of war.
These are being done in your name. And what are all these people hollering about? What's got them in such a lather? The fact that you know about it. The fact that you, as a citizen, know what is being to other people in other countries in your name. That's what's got them upset. In their minds, doing this isn't wrong. It's the fact that you know about it that's wrong. And if you, as a citizen, cannot find that outrageous, frankly, I can't imagine what would. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's the outrage of the week. And we are going to take a break. And we are back. And thank you for staying with us. Uh, A couple of minutes ago, I said something about misdirection, about misdirecting your attention in order to keep you from not looking at the real issue. I've got another example here. Uh, This one actually involves the economy, and it actually involves uh, the the health of the economy as a whole and the individual economic health of quite literally scores of millions of American families. Across the country, nearly 600 bills have been introduced in state legislatures to attack the collective bargaining rights and other activities of public sector workers and their unions. At least 10 states have passed such laws, although in one of those cases, Ohio, the law was actually overturned in a public referendum. The main target the reactionaries are using in in advancing this cause is pensions for public employees, which are branded as dangerously high, wildly out of control, incredible, over the top, oh my gosh, henny penny, they're going to turn us into Greece. A lot of arguments, though, a lot of these arguments, though, uh, and this is actually what I wanted to get to, a lot of the arguments that are advanced actually appeal to jealousy. It's like, you know, hey, compare what they get to what you get. What makes them so special? It's appealing to jealousy. Well, as a result of all this, there are moves on across the country, even in traditionally more liberal places like California, to cut, reduce, freeze, or in some other way, hack away at the pensions of public employees. In 2010, 11 states increased employee pension contributions for state workers. That is, employees had to put in more so employers could put in less. In 2011, 18 states did so, and 16 lengthened service requirements for being vested in the pension uh, and raised the age when you can start collecting your pension. Colorado, Minnesota, New Jersey, and South Dakota have postponed or cut cost of living adjustments for current retirees. And at least one of those cases, New Jersey, they're doing this while at the same time failing to raise taxes. Twice they failed to raise taxes on people making over a million dollars a year. Voters in in San San Diego and San Jose, California, just recently voted uh, uh, for cuts in pensions for present and future employees. Now... There are really two reasons why public health employee benefits, including things like pensions, are as good as... I mean, public employees generally have pretty good benefits. They do. Um, And there are really like two reasons, two reasons for that. One, these benefits are compensation for the fact that, contrary to popular mythology, on the whole, public employees typically earn less than comparably trained, educated, and experienced workers in the private sector. Uh, studies have shown the average difference to be somewhere between 4 and 7%. So that is, public employees uh, earn 4 to 7% less than equivalent private, empl- private sector employees. But here's the other reason, and this is the important one here, and this is the one I really want you to be aware of and, and remember. The kinds of pensions and benefits held by public employees used to be the norm for most major private companies in the country. But over the past several decades, there has been a vicious, unremitting attack on unions, particularly private sector unions. And as union representation has shrunk, so have benefits, so has the middle class. The difference for public workers, that is, is that their benefits have not fallen as fast as those in the private sector. That's where the difference comes from. They used to be about the same. But in the private sector, they plummeted. In the public sector, they've only dropped a little. That's where the difference arises. But instead of giving you an opportunity to focus on that, these elites have again, with 
unhappily, again, considerable success, uh, they've misdirected you. They've deceived you into looking the wrong way while the other hand performs the trick. They've gotten you to blame those that could be and should be your brothers and sisters in struggle, and instead um, have gotten you to blame them instead of blaming the actual thieves stealing away your future. This is the whole point here. When you hear someone, anyone, going on about, oh, those inflated pensions, oh, those inflated benefits of those, oh, public employees, the question that should immediately spring to your mind is not why do they have so much, it should be why do we have so little. An old Chinese proverb says that calling things by the right name is the beginning of wisdom. Recognizing who is actually your enemy is calling things by their right name. All right, last thing today. This very last thing I'm going to talk about today for the last uh, uh, several minutes. Uh, it revolves around this guy, Roberto Unger. He's one of, he was one of Barack Obama's former professors at Harvard Law School. He's a, he's a Brazilian, been active in politics there. He's uh, written a couple of books. He's a, he's a known scholar, all this. But he was, again, apparently Obama took two classes from him while he was at Harvard Law School. Well, Unger has caused something of a uh, stir by posting a YouTube video saying Obama must be defeated in the coming election. Defeated, but not for the reasons you might immediately think. No, no, no. Rather, it's because, quoting Unger, Obama has failed to advance the progressive cause in the United States and must lose so that the voice of democratic prophecy can speak once again in American life. In other words, Obama should be ousted from office because while he presented the promise of progressivism, he's governed as a center-rightist who has, among other things, these are all quotes from Unger, spent trillions of dollars to rescue the muddied interest and left workers and homeowners to their own devices, delivered the politics of democracy to the rule of money, and disguised his surrender with an empty appeal to tax justice. He has, Unger said, what I think is one of his strongest lines, uh, Obama has instituted there, that is the right wings, Obama has instituted their program with a humanizing discount. Obama's program is, in short, less a project than it is an abdication. Now, not surprisingly, the reaction among the Obama bots, who unfortunately include most of what passes for progressives these days, their reaction was one, it was a combination of ridicule and shock that someone could even propose such an incredible idea. Unger was called everything from naive to an idiot, with most people leaning toward the latter, with an occasional side foray into uh, sneering remarks about purity. Oh, sure, vote for Romney, that'll make everything all better, was a frequent and apparently supposed to be thought witty rejoinder. Even though Unger, of course, never said anything about supporting Romney. I mean, he's to the left of Obama. So he's not going to talk about voting for Romney, so just, but no matter. The thing is, to put all this another way, another short way, Unger is saying that Obama needs to lose because Barack Obama is too conservative. The thing is, as long as we accept what Barack Obama represents, as long as we accept his platform, his notions, as the outer reaches of what is possible, then those of us who actually hope for better will get nowhere. Now, in his video... Unger acknowledged that if a Republican wins the presidency, um, there will be a cost in judicial and administrative appointments. And that's true. We have to recognize that. That is true. That is a fact. Still, his point is that the choice we're faced is not between good and bad, but between bad and worse. And while it's true that worse is worse, it's also true that bad is bad. And if you accept bad as your standard, you will never get better. At some point, you have to make a decision. Are you willing to settle for? Is the best that you can hope for is that things will get worse a little more slowly than they otherwise might? Is the best that you can hope for is that income inequality will, income inequality will grow a little more slowly than it otherwise might? That the power of the banks will grow a little more slowly than it otherwise might? Uh, that your hope for your children's future will shrivel a little more slowly than it otherwise might? That the power of arbitrary authority will grow a little more slowly than it otherwise might? And here, I can't even include the prospect of civil liberties and privacy disappearing more slowly than they otherwise might, because under Obama, they've already been dis disappearing as fast, if not faster, than they were before. 
But is that the best you can hope for? Is that the best? Is that what you're prepared to settle for? At some point, you have to decide. Now, Josh Marshall is a guy who runs the blog called Talking Points Memo. He's a journalist, runs this, you know, one of the big blogs. Even he knows this. Now, he's no radical. He's no fan of third parties. He's no fan of independent candidacies. When Ralph Nader announced he was going to run for president back in 2004, Marshall called him a latter-day political narcissist, an enemy of progressive change, a cat's paw of the Republican Party, and a Pied Piper of political oblivion running on a platform of vacuous moral posturing and self-aggrandizement all in eight sentences. So he's no fan of independent candidacies, but even he said... He's come to, re- come to the realization, I'm quoting him here, the realization that the key condition of political, su- political success is almost always a genuine willingness to lose well. That you have to be able to say, on this ground, we are willing to lose. Now, the question, on what has Barack Obama ever done that? Where has Barack Obama ever stood and said, on this, I will win or I will lose, but this is where I stand? When has he ever done that? And as Marshall noted, and this is really important, a genuine willingness to lose means just that. You might lose. You might lose big. And that's the thing you have to face. But at some point, again, you have to make this choice. You have to decide. Now, here in Massachusetts, we actually have a great advantage. You want to try to help move that decision? Barack Obama is going to carry Massachusetts. Everybody thinks that. I mean, Romney might maybe make a decent run at him, but nobody thinks that Obama is not going, to, not going to win Massachusetts. So vote for somebody else. Don't vote for Barack Obama. Now, don't vote for George. Uh, don't, don't vote for, for Mitt Romney, for, you know, for pity's sake. But find somebody you figure you can vote for. For me, that's probably going to be Jill Stein. Find somebody you can vote for. Find somebody you can support. Vote for them. Make the point that there are alternatives. Make the point that there's a point beyond which you won't go. Make a point that there's a, there's a, there's a compromise beyond which you will not go. That there's a surrender to which you will not submit. Because if you don't, at some point, say, this is not good enough, it will never get better. So if what you see around you is as good as you're willing to have, then that's what you're going to get. If you want more, you have to risk losing. All right, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to wrap up there. Next week, I mentioned about unions here. Next week, I really intend to talk about the attacks, the ongoing attacks on unions and its effect on our lives and our lifestyles. In the meantime, stay cool. Have the best week you possibly can. Happy summer. See you next week.